and welcome to On The Ledge podcast. I'm your host, Jane Perrone, and this week we're going behind closed doors to look at IKEA greenhouse cabinet hacks. Plus, we hear from listener Zoe in New Zealand, and I answer a question about preventative measures for pests. Just a quick heads up about the next few weeks. There will be no episodes on January the 1st or January the 8th, with the show returning on January the 15th. And as I've already mentioned, there will be a special episode coming out on Thursday, December the 24th, which will be a sort of a festive relaxation episode. Nothing practical, but something that you might like to listen to over the festive break. And there will be episodes next Friday and the Friday after, that's December the 11th and the 18th as well. Thank you to Kichara from Switzerland and a lovely ladybird from Canada for leaving reviews for the show. And to Armani, Jenny and Harriet for becoming legends and to Craig and Chris for becoming super fans. Fabulous to have your support. And I'm still sending out my Patreon Christmas cards and posters to those of you who have included your address and are at the legend or super fan level, please do keep an eye on the post. If nothing arrives before Christmas, then do message me if you think you're owed a post out, because while I'm doing my best to coordinate everything, I've got quite a lot of cards to send. And do remember, if you're a Patreon subscriber, there is the option of switching from monthly to annual payment. This will also save you two months worth of money. I have sent a message about that. But again, if you've got any questions, do shoot me a line and I'll be happy to help. That's housekeeping knocked on the head. Let's crack on with the show. And the question of the week is how we're going to start. And it comes from Andy. Andy is a Patreon subscriber and he dropped me a line on Patreon with the following question. As an aqua aqua wrist, that's a really hard thing to say. Aqua wrist. As an aqua wrist, I can't say. I can't say it. As an aqua <laughs> aqua wrist. As an aqua wrist, I'm just going to keep going. I quarantine fish regularly, and sometimes will dose a general cure all into the quarantine tank just to be sure to catch any pathogens. I'm relatively new to house plant keeping and haven't really quarantined any plants, but have found some mealy bugs and had to treat for these. So my question is: Would you use a pesticide or natural pest controls on a plant not necessarily showing any symptoms of bugs? What a great question, and it's really good to see that you are putting your practical experience. I'm not going to repeat that word again because I clearly can't say it, but your practical experience with fish towards your houseplant habit, Andy. In terms of houseplants, I think as you've already indicated, quarantining new plants is a really good way of making sure that you don't introduce any pests or problems such as diseases to your houseplant clan. I appreciate if you've got a small home, this is a bit of a tricky one and I don't always do it myself, but I usually regret not doing it, I have to say. So if you can, new plants in a different room from all your other plants for a period of, well, up to four to six weeks will give anything that's wrong a chance to show itself. Things like mealybugs can remain hidden and then suddenly start to creep up to the visible parts of the plant and then you can catch them before you move the plant to your main collection. And I hear so many stories about people buying plants, mainly from big chains as opposed to specialist growers, but occasionally from the latter, where the plant comes home and already has a problem with spider mites or aphids or mealybugs. And so this is something to be really aware of, particularly if you're a new plant owner and you're just not used to dealing with pests because it can be quite a shock to discover there are things crawling about on your plants. In terms of any particular treatment for new plants, I can really understand the psychology of this. You want to just blitz them and tackle anything straight away. What I would say generally is that my rule with using any thing on my plants is that I don't do it unless I absolutely have to. 
If you've got glossy leaved foliage plants, then it's a great idea to wipe those leaves down with a damp cloth, as we discussed in our leaf shine episode last week. Or alternatively, place them in the shower and give them a good wash down. There is absolutely no harm in doing that. And, you know, checking for pests. Well, that should involve looking under the surface of the soil as well as on top of the soil for things like root mealybugs. Just that time and attention will be the thing that allows you to spot any pests before they spread to the rest of your houseplants. And there's also much debate about the question of whether you should repot plant as soon as you get them home. I don't think there's one hard and fast rule on this issue. It really depends on how the plant's looking, what it's potted in and what condition the soil is in. If you've got a cactus or a succulent that's in quite a heavy, possibly organic based mix, it may well be advisable to knock all of that potting mix off the roots and get it potted up into something much more appropriate, a half and half mix of grit or perlite and your houseplant potting medium of choice is what roughly what I would go for. Uh, if it's coming up to the dormant period for that plant, then that potting mix can be applied pretty much dry to avoid any possibility of root rot. Other plants, well, if it's a tropical plant that's probably going to be growing through the winter period anyway, then yes, again, certainly pot it up. Just make sure you don't give it a huge pot that you pot it one size up leaving just a small extra area of unrooted compost around the root ball for the roots to grow into. And the other occasion when I would say it's definitely worth repotting is if you buy a plant which is in a pot with no drainage hole. Yes, there are a few exceptions and plants that will survive without drainage, but on the whole, it's far better. And you've got a far better chance of success if that plant is potted into something with drainage. I do hope that helps, Andy. And if you've got a question for On The Ledge, drop me a line on theledgepodcast at gmail.com. Keeping tropical plants happy in the average home is not the easiest thing. So many of us resort to things like humidifiers in an attempt to keep that air humidity up. But in recent years, lots of growers have been turning to the giant Swedish superstore IKEA for a solution to their problem. Turning bog standard IKEA glass cabinets into beautiful indoor greenhouses for their precious plants. So how did this trend begin? What benefits can it offer and how do you go about doing it? My cabinet ministers for today are two Canadian plant growers, Cami and Vinnie, both of whom have tons of expertise in making awesome IKEA cabinets. Here's Cami, who's Cami Plants on Instagram, to explain how she first came across the concept. The first time I saw it was an um, Instagram page in, uh, called, it's by Robin. And she used to have like this wonderful IKEA setup where she had two, a Millsbo cabinet and a Fabricor cabinet. And it looked really nice. Um, and I had an, like one of those plastic greenhouses where I kept my more rare plants. And I really liked the idea of having something that will showcase the plants and, and look nice in a room, but also help with uh, to preserve the environment that they need to thrive. So that that's where I found it. I found it in Instagram uh, maybe a year and a half ago or so, and also found my friend Vinny, who had his setup all sorted and uh, we actually met because I started setting up mine through Instagram and he was showing me uh, tips and how to do it and and that's how we connected. Millsbow and Fabricor. As with all 
IKEA products, the names seem to come out of nowhere. But if you've ever seen an Instagram post with a cabinet with glass doors and walls and a metal frame and a fair number of aroids stuffed inside, then the likelihood is it's probably one of these items because they are sold in their millions all around the world. But what do these cabinets offer that makes them so much better than, well, just an average set of shelves? Cami believes it's all down to the control they give you over the environment for your plants. We all are getting into these expensive rare plants right now. And in order to keep them uh, thriving, they, we have to keep their environment to a certain standards, right? Humidity, light, air circulation. And it's harder to keep that into a perfect level when it, we are dealing with hundreds of square foot of, um, of a home. And if you keep the, the whole room super humid in our house, you know, we are prone to mold and things like that. So the IKEA cabinets are a perfect solution that looks nice in our homes and it's not like one of those plastic uh, greenhouses that we can buy online. So it looks aesthetically pleasing, it's easy to uh, rig into something that the plants will like and they're not super expensive because it's IKEA, it's something that you can get, you know, in a lot of places in the world right now. And so it's accessible, it's not super expensive and it keeps your plants happy. So I think that's why. And if your house is already filled with modern furniture with clean lines, possibly some of it bought from Ikea, then what better to display your plants in than a minimalist modern cabinet like a Millsbo or a Fabricor? Here's Vinny. For most people, it's because it becomes a statement piece within your home, if that makes any sense. Even when I made my first videos, I... I've mentioned that, that, you know, you have those Amazon greenhouses, they're plastic, and then they're technically better than the IKEA greenhouses, they're metal, and then you have to hack it so that it can become a greenhouse, um, but they don't look good in your house. So I think that is, that is the primary factor for most people. They want to put, like, their, their plants on display as part of the decoration of their house, instead of just putting it behind some sort of plastic sheet that people won't be able to see it through, that it won't look good in their living rooms. Obviously, uh, social media plays a huge factor, you know, as people build more and more of these greenhouses and they start posting photos, people will start to, uh, you know, see how beautiful they are and etc. And that, I believe, boosts its popularity and people will start to kind of buying them even though sometimes they don't even need them. They just buy it because they look good. So you've bought your cabinet and assembled it. What next? Can you just start sticking plants in it? Or is there anything else you need to do? Well, given these cabinets are not specifically designed to contain plants, there are a few little tweaks that you'll need to make before your plants can become ensconced. So the first thing that you need to figure out is the light. Whether your room has enough light to sustain the, them growing or if you do need uh, to bring in those extra lights. I would say that if you are going to bring in grow lights, definitely invest in grow lights that are going to withstand time. But also they, they have a very good spectrum so that the, 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 the plants grow in the right way. I also answered this question in my Q&A. Somebody was asking me, whether a plant could grow with just normal light and that sent me in a spiral of research. And then the answer is kind of because the way that plants photosynthesize, they, they see pretty much the entire visible uh, light spectrum, but they really thrive in the, I think it's in the blue and then in the red type of light, which creates that purplish light. So that's why you see that purple light going on. However, what I also figured out is that if you're in an environment like myself, you saw my room, I work in this room all day, all day, this is my office. If I have purple lights all over here, it will affect my vision because the human eye is not supposed to be in that type of light. Uh, so it actually is problematic for me. So that's why I decided to go with the white lights 
I don't know if they are as good as the purple ones, but they also cover a very good spectrum for, for the plant. And Vinny also points out that you need to be extra careful when it comes to electrical safety and your lights. That was a very interesting question that, um, that I got a couple times already around why is it that I put my grow light outside my, uh, my greenhouse? And it's mostly because they are running in, I think, 120. And then because of the humidity environment that exists within the greenhouse, if I get the, the connectors where, you know, the electricity sort of connects to the light, if that rusts, I'm creating a fire hazard for myself. So I think that's one thing that I, I keep on telling people, like, if you're going to put that sort of equipment inside of a greenhouse, it would be good to know whether it can withstand that type of environment. Uh, so you don't, you're not creating a situation where you can, you know, you can set your house on fire, unfortunately. And what other pieces of kit might you need for your cabinet? Over to Cami for a bit of a shopping list. I recommend like a, a small humidifier. You might have to fill it more, but it gives you more space inside the greenhouse to put more plants. And um, also I recommend a USB fan to keep the air moving. A lot of people use the, uh, replace the glass shelves for um, wire, but I keep, I have one that has a wire shelf, but all the rest have glass. Um, and uh, the reason why I choose this is because I, I built terrarium. So the idea of keeping the uh, like environments in between shelves as separate, that doesn't sound so bad to me. Like I, it, it's okay if the, Humidity varies by like a few percentage, uh, but um, but yeah, both both things are good. So wire shelving, humidifier, and USB fans. If you want to make your cabinet extra cozy and stop that precious moist air from leaking out, you can also employ some weather strips to keep the air contained. I have been uh, doing a test actually in my uh, Millsbo cabinets in where I weather strip one fully. Uh, so all around the doors and all the crevices. I haven't siliconed the uh, glass yet. But uh, the reason why I did this is just to see how much the humidity varies in between the one that is all enclosed and the one that is not. And uh, I say it's about 10% higher humidity at all times. And so it fluctuates a lot less as well. Um, so yes, the weather stripping, I just use the like, you know, window weather stripping is like a little foam strip with a, one side has adhesive. I got it in, uh, in Amazon, but I'm sure any like any store lows or anything like that will, will have it as well. Um, and and yeah, it's not very expensive and it's a great way to make your cabinet be a little bit more sealed so you don't need to put the humidifier up uh, on all the time. So you've got your cabinet all set up, but what should you fill it with? It is partly a question of experimentation, according to Cami and Vinny, but Vinny does point out there are some plants that just aren't that keen on the ultra-humid close environment of the cabinet my rule of thumb is if the if the plant is not a velvety plant if it's not you know like the melanochrysum you know the inferium regale uh and it's more of like a, a monstera or a philodendron borosuano that is that there are a little bit of a hardier plants they might survive in there but it's not necessary for you to have them in there my Thai constellation, from what I've heard from other collectors and growers, that plant is very prone for root rot. So for me, for me, that was, I think, the, the most critical plant I've had because it was my very first so-called rare plant. I really don't like the term, but just for the sake of it. Um, and it was, I put it in there and then three weeks later, it just started to fall apart. And it went in a spiral where it took me about a year to see another leaf growing in the, in the plant. So it's like a year full of like of recovery in that plant outside of the greenhouse. So 
it's important for you to know your plants and understand their requirements as far as humidity goes. Um, because it's like, I believe those, those, those cabinets are, are more so designed for primarily the velvety plants, not so much the hardier plants. So, like everything in life, the cabinet isn't perfect. It can exacerbate the problem of root rot, as Cami explains. The general consensus is that pickier plants that prefer high humidity are also just more difficult in general just because they rot really easily as well. So once we start bumping up the humidity to keep them happy from the leaves from, you know, turning brown and or getting crispy and all that then they the roots they just get too much humidity the the soil does never dry out so then you get the rot so there's a few ways to combat that you know put a layer of pebbles underneath your soil i've seen that going around and seems to be really uh, working really well um but the fan is the easiest thing you know just put the fan in and and just make the air circulate. And as I've already pointed out, these IKEA cabinets have not been designed for plants. So the other major enemy of success is rust, which is not surprising given how much of a moist environment you're creating. But there are some ways around it, as Vinny points out. My first uh, cabinet had a little bit of, uh, of rust going on, mostly because of the mistakes that I've made. My last cabinet is, I'm looking at it right now, and I see minimum amounts of rust, but there is definitely some rust going on. It's absolutely critical that you clean your cabinets, and then you're looking over it. But the best way for you to avoid it, it's by ensuring that there is no water around the cabinet. So let's say my, my routine is... I water my plants on the weekends and then I shower hose all of them and then I put them in the in the cabinets. As soon as I do that, my cabinet gets humidity. The humidity gets really high and then sometimes you would see um, a little bit of water dripping inside of uh, the cabinet in the glasses, that condensation going on. Uh, generally what I do, I just bump it up the, um, the fan and then the fan starts to kind of like move that air faster or I can open up the door slightly. But it's important that you're consistently looking at it so that you don't see water in the cabinet. Generally, you would see them at the bottom shelves if you have the, the wire shelves. Uh, so you just just wipe it off. Otherwise, you will for sure get, get rust. What's lovely about listening to Vinny and Cami talk about their cabinets is it's quite clear what a collaborative community of cabinet makers there are on the internet and particularly on Instagram. And Vinny and Cami are both important parts of that community, along with Robin, who is the creator of the account IKEA Greenhouse Cabinet on Instagram, where much of this information and beautiful pictures of people's cabinets are shared. I'll put links to all three of their Instagram accounts in the show notes. So do go and check them out. They really are a fount of knowledge. And it's wonderful to see such generosity in sharing information. The community has been really, really, really positive in in many, many ways. Because one of the things that I've said in my first video was when I was building this, the more experienced people in the plant community, they weren't really willing to share information about how they care for their plants, which is weird to me. I come from a design background and in the design community, we, we discover something. It's all over the internet. We are just sharing knowledge. And then I wanted to, I wanted to stop that. And I wanted to be like, you know what? I've killed many plants. I have a build right now that it's been running for six months. And I really want to share this with other people. So if they want to do it, they would do it in a safe way so they don't get to lose their plants. And that's kind of how the community sort of got built off. Uh, it was just a combination of Robin doing an excellent work of finding those greenhouses, scattering the internet and centralizing it. And then myself 
getting featured and working with her to share their knowledge in her Instagram account. And lucky for the rest of us, where Cammy, Robin and Vinny have made mistakes, we can learn from them and avoid expensive errors that they've had to go through. Unfortunately for me, it has cost me a little bit more because I've experimented with it. But if you follow the recipe that I've put online, you'll probably be able to maximize it and make it a, you know as minimal as possible. Obviously, you, you buy the cabinet and then you have to buy the fans. The fans that I recommend are a little bit more expensive. Um, I think they're $100 each. I, I don't remember. And when you buy them, they come in a, in a pair. Uh, and then you also have to buy the shelving. The shelving all together comes about like 100 plus as well, in between 100 and 150. Uh, if you have these two components, you're, you're set. The lights I use are about $60 each. So I have one per greenhouse. So I have three greenhouses. That means that I have six lights. Um, so it, 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 it adds up. Um, I think it's very important for people to understand that First, you need to understand your current environment that will dictate how much money you need to invest in the greenhouse. Uh, I got a very nice question once in my Q&A series where somebody said, I live, I believe in Florida. Do I need to buy one of these? Actually, the question was, would you recommend buying one of these if you lived in Florida? And my answer was no. Um, Right off the back, I would rather just have open shelves in my house and then just display my, my plants that way because it is an investment and it, 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 it goes beyond just being an investment of your money. It is an investment of time to maintain them. If I, if I, if I were to clean my, all the greenhouses, uh, it would probably take me four to five hours to clean them properly. Uh, you don't have to do that if you just have open shelves if that makes any sense. And you don't have to use an IKEA cabinet either. Although there are outposts of IKEA in many parts of the world, not every country or area has one. So what do you do if you are Millsbo light? Well, there are other options, says Cami. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it doesn't have to be IKEA. It can just like I sometimes find in like Facebook mar marketplace, a lot of uh, cabinets that are like, perfect and you know it looks so beautiful and uh and it would be even cheaper to just you know get one like that and just retrofit it to keep the plants i i would just be a little bit uh more wary about wood because they can uh get moldy pretty easy uh so it, that might need a little bit of a special treatment but i i, I would say still be fine uh and better than than not having it, I think. So whether you are new to this trend or an old hand at IKEA cabinets, I hope this has provided you with some inspiration. And if you've got a cabinet, well, do send me a picture. I'd love to see it. And thank you so much to my guest today, Vinny, who's Vinny.aroids on Instagram and Camilla or Cami Law, both of whom were so generous with their time. And if you're a Patreon subscriber, you'll be able to go and hear both of their full interviews next week, including Cami talking about her super rare variegated monster ad Sony eyes. Yes. And you can see pictures of both their cabinets in the show notes. And now it's time to hear from our listener this week. And it's Zoe. Hi, I'm Zoe. I'm from Wellington, New Zealand. I run a gardening business and I first got into houseplants when I started getting an influx of job applications from very enthusiastic people in their 20s who all wanted to start nurseries. I had an old philodendron atom in the bathroom and we planted monstera in people's gardens for a more tropical feel, but that was my entire experience. So seeing the monstera craze come up and a huge range of enthusiastic people coming into the industry was a whole new world for me. I started collecting indoor plants and teaching propagation to my staff. As time went on, I started killing some of my plants, and I realised that experience in greenhouses and outdoor plants will only get you so far. It got me hooked. I recently scaled back my hoard, but am always swapping cuttings or propping them to pass on. Question one. 
You've been selected to travel to Mars as part of the first human colony on the Red Planet. There's only room for one houseplant from your collection on board. Which plant do you choose? I would have to choose my vanilla planifolia. It climbs well and it flowers, so it could get big and help me feel like there were more plants in the apartment. I hope that there would be intense temperature and humidity controls, so I could make my living space a greenhouse for it. I'll be able to have it flower and set seed too. I don't know how people f- would feel about me taking precious water from our reserves to pump it into my apartment, but maybe I can bribe them with vanilla pods. Question two. What is your favourite episode of On the Ledge? I was going to say my favourite episode was the interview with Tyler Thrasher, but in the past few weeks I have realised that episode 152 on silicon has been life-changing. Working outside, I am always cut up by grasses, especially some of our natives, and being able to relate that back to silicon and what its purpose is has made me a much more patient person. The function of silicon in plants is my current fact to share, and it never fails to spark others' interest too. It has reignited an interest in how specific soil amendments will impact the plant on a smaller level than we are usually inclined to think about. Question three. Which Latin name do you say to impress people? I say Tradescantia fluminensis. It isn't a particularly hard one, but in Wellington, Tradescantia suffocates our native species, so I use it a lot. I feel like referring to Tradescantia by non-racist botanical names is one of the easy ways to combat racism in this world, and using the Latin name for Tradescantia stops most people in their tracks because, rightly or wrongly, it is seen as the most correct term. I say rightly or wrongly because there is another level to racism, where botanists have travelled the world and given a bunch of plants scientific Latin names without necessarily consulting the indigenous people. But I'm doing my best. Saying Tradescantia is a correction that almost everyone sees as educational, not preachy. So I hope that using its proper name is making a difference. Question four. Crassulation, acid metabolism or gutation? Gutation. Always gutation. There is nothing better than seeing the big, beautiful droplets on my golden pothos. I feel like if we're going to own houseplants, they should be gluttons and treated like absolute royalty. And having a plant so spoilt that it is dripping water makes me feel like I am spoiling a child. Question five. Would you rather spend £200 on a variegated monstera or £200 on 20 interesting cacti? I would love to spend £200 on a variegated monstera. I feel like it's so easy to pick up a plant and take it home. Nowadays, I really have to convince my family that I need it. And I'd rather splash out and get something really special. Plus, cacti are fun and great, but they have spikes and they would take up all of our windowsills. I would prefer a rainforest than plants that want to embed themselves into my skin. Thank you, Zoe. So great to hear from you. And I know what you mean about cacti. I have just managed to get a cactus spine out of my thumb after it's sitting there embedded for about a month. Uh, (laughs) So I'm glad to be rid of that. Now, don't be shy. If you'd like to be featured on Meet the Listener, we would love to hear from you. Drop a line to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com and we will pass on details of how to take part. Well, that just about wraps up this week's show. Thank you for joining me and I wish you My son and I have been dreaming up new superheroes this week, including my effort, which was called the Chefinator. And the Chefinator fires off bowls of hot noodles from his fingers to take out the baddies. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's ever going to make it to the movies, but it got me thinking about houseplants and realising how many superpowers our houseplants have. They really are amazing. So take a fresh look at your plants today. They're basically snacking on sunlight. How awesome is that? I shall leave you with that thought. Do have a fabulous week. I'm Jane Perone. This is On The Edge. Bye. music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by the Joy Drops A Man Approaches with Bode Sitar Rishikesh by Samuel Corwin Chiefs by Jazar and Overthrown by Josh Woodward 
All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit janeperone.com for details.